Okay. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. I would like to welcome you all to parallel session five of the 2021 Global Symposium on Soil Biodiversity. This is one of the four sessions of theme three, Soil Biodiversity Shaping the Future of Food Systems. They, this, uh, they are taking place today and tomorrow. So it is a great honor to be here with all of you. My name is Edmundo Barrios and I will be uh, moderating this two hours session. Just a, some uh, housekeeping uh, information. During the first hour, we will be listening to four presentations of 10 minutes each. I would kindly remind you, the presenters, to keep to 10 minutes so that we can have time for the Q&A session uh, at the end of, of, at the end. At minute nine of your intervention, I'll let you know that there is one minute left. Indeed, it is important to allow 20 minutes for questions and answers at the end. So there will be four consecutive presentations and the second hour will follow the same format. Before starting, I will kindly ask all of you to check the Zoom chat as some rules and information on this session will be posted. For the Q&A session, please use the chat to post your questions and include at the beginning of each question, the name of the presenter to whom your question is addressed to. We will choose a few questions to be answered live and the rest will be answered via chat. The host of the meeting is Julie Itei, and she's here to help you for any technical issues. So please do not hesitate to write to her directly using the private message option of the chat box if needed. Without further delay, I would like to uh, now to give the floor to Mr. Patrick Muzinguzi from Makerere University in Uganda, who will give his presentation entitled Minimal Herbicide-Based Conservation Tillage Enhances Soil Macrofauna Abundance and Distribution in Uganda. The floor is yours, Mr. Muzinguzi. Uh, thank you. Um... I hope everyone is seeing the screen. Not yet, but it's coming. Yeah, um, uh, good afternoon from Uganda, Kampala. Um, this is uh, uh, Patrick Musinguzi, and uh, I'm happy to join you on this. Can you please uh, make it important. big? Can you put it in presentation mode, in the full screen mode? Yes, there. Excellent, perfect. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm presenting on minimum, minimal herbicide-based conservation tillage enhances soil macrofauna abundance and distribution in Uganda. And this work is ongoing, but with my colleagues, Professor Tua and uh, another colleague, Aine Mukama from Kampala here at Makere University. Um, so by introduction, uh, use of pesticides and other agrochemicals has extensively increased worldwide to control weeds and pesticides. And um, in Uganda, the use of glyphosate is increasingly becoming a common chemical in Uganda as a result of uh, failure to use a lot of mechanized agriculture and people are looking at it as a cheap option to engage in terms of killing weeds and uh, responding to farming especially in our systems here. Uh, there is an assumption that this, it, the, this chemical is less, less toxic to nature and humans, and that it has have less likelihood of persisting in the environment as compared to other herbicides. However, it can have direct effects on soil biodiversity. Uh, so the problem why we went into this study with my colleagues is glyphosate is uh, widely used by many farmers in this country and it could be having long-term effects on soil macrofauna and soil health. And the impact of using this herbicide in Uganda to 
especially in controlling weeds, has had very limited studies. So we still don't know how this weed master, uh, or what we're calling glyphosate, can actually impact on different macro and microorganisms. But this study, we're looking at the impact of this uh, chemical, which is widely spreading across the country in terms of usage on the uh, on the management on, on the soil biodiversity, uh, since it's one of the tools, what is one of the chemicals that is being used under conservation tillage to minimize disturbance of the soil, but it has also impacts on soil health. So the, basically, in this study, we are trying to look to, to assess the impact of herbicide-based conservation tillage on soil macrofauna variations in the soils of Uganda. And uh, basically, that was our main focus, so that we're able to see how um, this is affecting the conditions in the country. Um, so th this, as I've already mentioned, this study is, on, is ongoing. Uh, it was conducted in, uh, uh, in southwestern Uganda, uh, that region near uh, Renzori High Hills, those who know Renzori Mountain. So it was going around that region. And uh, we just looked at the fields that have been under the spraying of this chemical for a long time. Uh, but in this particular study, we looked at three fields. And in these fields, we had fields that had about 10 days. Uh, we collected samples from fields that have been under upside application for the last 10 days. But also looked at the fields that have been applied that ha that have been applied with this herbicide after about two months. Those are about 60 days. But also we had fields which had not been applied with any herbicide at all. Um, so we were able to sample some termites, earthworms, millipedes, and centipedes, um, and we used the quadrat approach of 65 by 65 measurements, which had us an inner quadrat of 23, 25 by 25 centimeters. And we also excavated soils up to a lot, up to a depth of 30 centimeters in the depth of 0 to 20, 20 to uh, 0, to 20, 0 to 10, 10 to 20, and 20 to 30. So we did an extraction, especially for the earthworm using the powdered reagents, which we know is a, a global approach of uh, establishing the earthworm and, and counting. We also looked at the uh, termites, the, the millipedes, and also we were able to sort them out manually on plastic trays. And we did an abundance check. Uh, we only stopped an abundance check to look at the number of organisms per a square meter and the biomass also was calculated in grams per square meter. So we did a data analysis uh, using the analysis of variancy, uh, which is known as a good statistical approach, a gen stat approach. And we separate the means using the, the Fisher's least significant difference. So what, what we are finding out in our systems here is that um, uh, from all the fields that we are able to sample, it's all, it is of, of course, clear that if you leave the soil undisturbed with herbicides, without using herbicides, you tend to have uh, a better soil health condition in terms of the soil microbiota composition in the soil. So you can see in this country where we do not add anything, we really see uh, positivity. There were, there were no much effect in biodiversity. The, the microorganisms were well uh, distributed, were, were in abundance. Eh? But when we compare this with where we had treated, where there was early application of this herbicide, we saw a decline. We saw a decline in, uh, in the use of, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the abundance of these uh, organisms, especially with earthworms. Also, we saw that with the millipedes, also with the termites. Uh, so this is already a reflection that, well, um, we, we are applying the chemicals in our region, but it seems the data which is able to guide us on regulating on the optimal amounts of herbicide to use in our regions or optimal amounts to apply, uh, I think we have been having limited evidence of data to guide us. And of course, uh, our people continue using these chemicals widely in the country. In fact, there is increasing use of these chemicals in the country, suggesting that uh, we need to have a lot of data to, to track, to, to, to guide the nation on increasing amounts of chemicals used. And these other graphs are just showing us the trends with the depth uh, still the same trend was observed where we didn't have any disturbance. You can see uh, good amounts of earthworm activity in the, in the environment. But again, if you disturb it after uh, two months, 
After two months, again, we could see some bit of regeneration, but the one which was recently applied, where the upside had been recently applied, we saw a very uh, significant decline in earthworm uh, abundance in a per square meter of the land that we are assessing, the land use we are assessing. Similar patterns we observe with the millipede. So uh, again, this is suggesting that, well, we are applying a lot of chemicals, but there are, there are some implications. And of course, in developed countries, this is uh, known that use a lot, they use a lot of herbicides. But for developing country, we, we, I think there has not been enough data to support uh, this trend in terms of declining uh, patterns of uh, the biodiversity in terms of microorganisms, in terms of, I mean, the abundance. I know this work is still ongoing because we are supposed to look at even the, the details of the types of the species we are working with, the types of organisms we are working with, and, the, and, and basically apply even the Simpson diversity index to further understand the biodiversity. But these were preliminary observations. Um, so what we are finding out is the herbicide use in tropical soils in terms of finalizing this study. Uh, the herbicide use in tropical soils for weeding and conservation tillage is a practice that is significant at disrupting the patterns of the soil biodiversity. Uh, there was also a clear effect of herbicide use on earthworm millipedes abundance, which is a key indicator of agrochemical impacts on the soils. Uh, we think that we need to do a lot of studies in this region to study the soil biological components in the soil over time as a result of continuous use of glyphosate herbicide, which we know is one of the broad spectrum systemic herbicide, and of course, which is an, organi an organophorous uh, Do you have one kind minute? of component, which is actually uh, playing a critical role in supporting most of our uh, resource constrained farmers. They use it because it's very expensive to hire a tractor to dig the land. So they normally apply this glyphosate uh, glyphosate to ensure that they, they do the farming uh, on time, but also minimize on the cost of mechanization. So long-term effects of chemicals on the soil microfauna can help. Long-term studies of those chemicals on soil microfauna can help understand a bit of soil biodiversity. I thank you. I thank the university for supporting this work, the laboratory that helped us to do the counting and which is the work which is ongoing. I thank them for helping us to do the work with the lab and the Global Symposium on Soil Biodiversity team for inviting us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for uh, an interesting presentation, highlighting the impact of herbicide-based conservation tillage practices on different soil macrofauna and the use of one of, of, of classical uh, standard methodologies, the, the TSBF monolith method, uh, which is great to see it in, in action. Uh, with this, thank you. And, and now I would like uh, to invite to the floor Miss um, Mary Bartz from University of Coimbra in Portugal, who will give her presentation entitled Perceptions on soil macrofauna in the agricultural field. The floor is yours, Mary. You need to unmute yourself. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, perfectly. Thank you, Mr. Edimundo. Um, can you see the presentation? Yeah, now you need to put it in, 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 in full screen. So, yeah, perfect. Yeah, Please go so, ahead. So now I'm Mahi Bartz from the University Coimbra University, uh, and I will present you this our work on perceptions on soil macrofauna in the agricultural field. And as to begin, uh, it's unquestionable the importance, the role that soil biodiversity plays in our ecosystems. We have around 25% for our global biodiversity in the soil, so it's really an amazing universe under our feet that we need to, to be discovered, valued, and improved for our sustainability in our agroecosystems. Uh, but one of the treats on soil biodiversity is the agricultural intensification. This intensification, like the conventional planting, uh, leads to problems like soil erosion, soil compaction, soil pollution, the loss of soil organic matter and nutrients, and all these things are being harmful for the soil macrofauna, it's disrupting completely their home, that's the, the soil. 
But in other hand, the adoption of more conservative uh, systems or ways like the no tilled systems, we can preserve and improve uh, the environment uh, to the soil macrofauna, enhancing their functions in the systems. So in this way, you know, seeing the importance of the soil macrofauna and that they are quite uh, 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 see this, the importance of the soil macrofauna, we wanted to evaluate the social perception uh, on these organisms among the farmers and other stakeholders working in the ag agriculture contest, mainly in Brazil. So we prepared a um, questionnaire from, with 12 questions. These questions uh, we ask about the profile from the interviews, the soil organism, the soil management, and we applied it in two uh, events, uh, two editions from the National No Tillage Meeting in 2008 and 2018. So we have a 10 years uh, time apart of uh, these both uh, applications. Uh, from the region of origin, from the interviews, uh, we had 100% from the interviews from South America. Um, and we have in 2008, 80, seven answers from 600 participants, a small amount of people from Paraguay and 92% from Brazil. In 2080, from 570 participants, 81 answered this uh, questionnaire and 100% of them, uh, they uh, were from Brazil. Uh, the region was quite determinant uh, for some of these, these uh, answers. So the meeting from, two, from 2008 was held in South Brazil in Paraná State. So in this way, we have 55% of the interviews were from this state from Paraná in South Brazil. And in 2018, the meeting was held in Mato Grosso. And so in this way, we had 76% of the interviews from this state. From the interviews, the, the, the profession from, from them, the outstanding is that 30, more than 30% from them are farmers. And another percentage uh, was from technical assistance and the other was uh, 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 the, the third amount of a percentage in the interviews related mostly to the students. The size of the farm or the land that was managed from the professionals or the farmers or the extensionists working was quite different among the years due to the difference between the regions. But in 2008, 13% had uh, less than 20 hectares, 28% from 101 to 500 hectares, and 36% more than 2,001 uh, hectares. And in 2018 was quite a different uh, condition with more than 61% of the interviews had more than 2000 hectares. The one part of our questionnaire was to, to try to, to, to see what the, the interviews think about organisms considered to be pests, the control of this, these organisms and the management practices used by these interviews. And so in this way, we, we put uh, the, in the question, we put uh, nine groups of the soil macrofauna, the most known groups that uh, usually the farmers and the professionals and now uh, that they are uh, used to see in, in the field. And when we, we, we ask about which of them are considered pests, now six of them were the most, uh, uh, had the most percentage with more than, 30% of the response, and the other three had less than 10% uh, considered it as as uh, as best. So, no. and then some uh, um, difference among the years that beetles and uh, termites had a reduction, uh, ants also, and millipedes had a reduction from 2008 to 2009, 18 to the response. And so we ask if the, the is observed an increase of the pests in the fields, and yes, there is really an, an, a huge uh, a percentage in both years. In 2008, 61% of the interviews uh, observed the increase of pests. In 2008, 
And the reasons for this pest uh, increase, they related it to the excessive use of pesticides and the monoculture. And uh, seeing that in 2018 uh, was uh, more expressive this, uh, with, with higher uh, percentage in this year. And when then what kind of management they used to the pest control, so the fallow, the use of uh, chemicals and the pesticides and the mechanical uh, practices are the most uh, used through the, the interviews. And seeing that um, in 2018 was a reduction in the fallow yeah, and uh, more in the half. And of course, it's related also in the condition from the region. But also there was a, a, a decrease and here an increase in 2018 in the use of uh, chemical and mechanical practices. In the other hand, uh, comparing the years, there were some uh, options more uh, less harmful alternative like um, uh, uh, alternative methods, uh, integrated pest management and biological methods. They really have an increase in 2018 showing that during these 10 years was uh, the, the farmers and other stakeholders are using uh, some other options less harmful in this environment. In the other part, so we put this, the, the same organisms that they should as, tell us which of them they consider as beneficial in the agro system, uh, in the agro ecosystems, the good practices and about soil health. So the same question that was put as best, we also put as the organism as beneficial. So of course, then outstanding the earthworms were the, the most uh, with the higher percentage, uh, spider then also, but also they, they, there were six other groups, beetles, termites, ants, millipedes and citipedes that has a percentage uh, around uh, um, from 10 to 25% of the response. But uh, looking to the years, the spiders, centipedes, and beetles had a reduction in the percentage, uh, considering them, uh, them as beneficial. And then the question regarding the management that favored the soil biodiversity, outstanding was the green manure, the crop rotation, the no tillage system, and keeping native forest fragments where the four uh, with higher percentage uh, along the, the answers. But the, the bad thing was that in 2008, the percentage regarding these this good practices was reduced. And that's kind of contrasting in what we see, what they responded in some questions and in other questions in the interview. On the other hand, the integrated pest management had an increase in 2018 showing that that's the, the use of, of this kind of management is useful to enhance the biodiversity and the agricultural systems. And the other question that how they could assess the soil health, uh, the three uh, uh, options, now many organisms, many aerosomes and soil aggregation have had the most, uh, the, the higher percentage. The interesting is you know, looking that they, they, they answered many organisms, but when we look to the other questions, most of them are considered pests. Airstorms, of course, is, uh, it's, it's a universal bioindicator and soil aggregation that uh, the, the structure of soil is quite an uh, interesting uh, view for the, for the farmers and extensionists to, to use as soil health. And the worms and soil aggregation had a reduction when they, they related it to the soil health in 2018. So as conclusions of this work, most of the soil macrofauna that are, that are not perceived as beneficial. There was an increase in the pest incidence uh, in the, uh, in, as the, the, the interviews observe. There is a decreasing trend in the application of the good practices after 10 years. That's quite worrisome. And now to, to, to look at that. And they really need to foster a capacity of building and dissemination of the evidence regarding the importance and function of soil biodiversity and society, as we see in, in, the, in the response, there is some kind of confusion and overlapping in what they think that's good or is bad for our uh, environment. 
So I would like to thank the organization, the symposium for this invitation and uh, thank you for, for your attention. Um, thank you very much, uh, Marie. And thank you um, for your presentation, highlighting the, the variation in perceptions on, on soil macrofauna uh, of people linked to no-till farming workshops conducted in Brazil in a 10-year period. This was very interesting to see the change and also to reflect on the importance of the context where these workshops took place, because they are very particular differently in the Mato Grosso region and the, in the in the south region, the, I think it is quite contrasting. Yeah. Probably that's behind some of the of the results found, but we'll see in the discussion. Thank you very much, and I, I, I would now like to to give the floor to uh, Ms. Julia Plunger from Institute for Alpine Environment in Italy, who will give her presentation entitled "Biodiversity in Hay Meadows." Effects of intensive agriculture on epigeic macroinvertebrates. The floor is yours. Um, yeah, I yeah. try to share my screen. Yes, please. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Now can okay. you make it full screen. Yeah. So. Perfect. There you go. So. Hello, my name is Julia Plunger. I'm working at the Institute for Alpine Environment at Eurac Research in Bozen Bolzano in Italy. And today I would like to present the main results of my masterpieces with the title Biodiversity in Hay Meadows, Effects of Intensive Agriculture on Ground Dwelling Macroinvertebrates. So the study was conducted in South Tyrol, a small province in the north of Italy. And here agriculture is uh, an important sector. Animal husbandry is practiced almost all over the province and it is a important incoming source for the mountain farmers. And the agriculture sector um, has changed in the last 50 years and intensification of, it, of agriculture is an ongoing process. The conditions of farming have changed and the trend is to maintain a higher stocker, um, stocking density for which a higher productivity of matters is required. So um, we aimed in this study at elaborating how the community structure of ground dwelling invertebrates is affected by management intensity. And especially we evaluated the impact of the key management practices, namely the number of cuttings per year and the amount of fertilizers applied on the species um, composition. So we asked, um, one question was if the management type have an impact on the species composition, species richness and species diversity of ground dwelling invertebrates. And the second question was, are there some species which are preferring a specific type of meadows? So, the study sites were located in Bavi and Barbiano, a small village in South Tyrol. And there we selected six um, mountain hay meadows. From the six meadows, three were subjected to intensive and three to extensive um, agricultural practices. So the three extensively used hay meadows um, were moved only once a year and not fertilized, whereas the three intensively used hay meadows were um, moved and fertilized up to five times per year. So for investigating the um, ground dwelling invertebrates, we installed four pitfall traps in every meadow for a period of four weeks, once in autumn 2018, and then for a second time in spring 2019. 
After the, when the sampling um, was finished, we sorted all macroinvertebrates and identified them at least to other levels. We, um, the spiders, harvestmen, um, ground beetles, roof beetles, ants and grasshoppers were identified when possible then to species level. In addition, we also conducted a vegetation survey to identify all plant species in every meadow for having the plant species number. So coming now to the results. So we found significant um, differences between species composition and the treatment and the season. And you can see here in this non-metric multidimensional scaling where we have um, the full community of the ground dwelling macroinvertebrates, the, the, the treatment, and um, also the, the two seasons. And you can see that um, each um, spot represents a pitfall trap and the spider web centers are the um, weighted centers of the management. So you can see that um, the first axis um, separates well the um, two seasons, whereas the um, second axis um, separates well the, the two treatments. And you can also see that the plant species richness was higher in the extensively used hay meadows, um, which you can see um, on this blue arrow. Then we um, selected four um, groups or four taxa where we did um, the identification to species levels, um, which are the leucocida, which are the wolf spiders, the carabida, which are the ground beetles, the staphylinida, which are the roof beetles, and vomitida, which are the ants. And you can see um, here very well for the leucocida that, uh, that we found a clear separation between the extensive and intensively used meadows and also for the two seasons. Um, regarding the carabid beetles, we did not find such a clear um, pattern like for the leucocida, but we found the uh, a separation between the two seasons. The Staphylinida um, indicate a separation where some species prefer um, either the extensively or the intensively used meadows, whereas for the Formitida we found the most indistinct pattern, so here we did not find clear differences regarding the um, treatments or the seasons. Then we um, made uh, or we calculated the um, activity density for the, these four selected groups and the parameters of the individuals per day, the species richness and the Shannon biodiversity index. And you can see here that um, regarding the activity density that the leucocida had the highest activity density during the spring season, whereas here for the formicida, um, they had the highest activity density during the autumn season. Having a look now on the species richness, here we found that the Staphylinida had a significant higher species richness in intensively used hay meadows, whereas um, the carabid beetles tend to have a higher species richness in extensively used hay meadows. So coming now to the conclusion. So the first question was, does the management type have an impact on species composition, species richness, and species diversity of ground dwelling and um, invertebrates? And we can confirm this because we found um, significant differences for all of them. But this not necessarily means that the extensively used hay meadows had, the, had a higher um, species richness or species diversity. 
And the second question was, are there some species which are preferring a specific type of meadows? And also this can be confirmed because we found some species that we that um, were that prefer a specific type of meadow. So we found them only in the intensively or in the extensively used hay meadows. Sometimes we found only a small number, but having a look on the species ecology and the preferences say that they should be in that habitat. So yeah, for example, one minute left. Uh -huh. Thank you. So, for example, um, species that prefer dry habitats um, would not be in the irrigated um, intensive um, meadows. So, now to sum up, we can confirm that intensively used hay meadows differ from the extensively used meadows regarding the ground dwelling macroinvertebrates. And some groups were inhibited by the intensive management, and while spiders like the leucocida, for example, were not much affected by the intensive land use. And now I am at the end of my presentation, and I will thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, and thank you for an interesting presentation, um, highlighting the impact of hay production, intensification, and seasonality on ground-dwelling microinvertebrates. Very interesting. And now I would like to uh, give the floor to Mr. Rashid Musadek from Icarda Inra in Morocco, who will give his presentation entitled Soil Organic Carbon and Enzymatic Activity Under Conservation Agriculture in Moroccan Dryland. The floor is yours, Rashid, Mr. Rashid. Thank you, Edmondo. Uh, you hear me? Yes, perfect. So I will try to share my, my presentation. Do you see it? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Please go okay. ahead. Thank you. So um, um, my presentation will uh, mainly focus in on soil organic carbon uh, quality and quantity and enzymatic activities um, under conservation ag agriculture in uh, Moroccan dryland. I will did this presentation no name of my colleagues and teams from uh, INRA, Morocco, and also some um, universities with some uh, PhD students. Um, just for your information, in Morocco, uh, we have uh, mainly a cereal based system, and we have more than, uh, um, can I say, 50% of our land uh, or uh, 0.5 million hectares under cereal system. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, our uh, uh, soil um, used for this uh, agricultural land have a uh, low organic matter. Uh, a recent study that we did in Morocco showed that we have uh, more than 60% of our land have less than 2% of organic matter, which is um, seeing that uh, what we use as conventional system is not sustainable anymore. And uh, that's why we have uh, some high uh, level of uh, soil erosion rates. Uh, we have also a compaction problem we have also some problem uh, concerning um, the uh, way wa water erosion um, and uh, soil degradation, land degradation. So the question was, uh, will soil remain productive when we still use this intensive uh, tillage and, uh, and system of, uh, of uh, uh, cereal beds, used in cereal beds system? So soil organic carbon, which is the poor of the most soils, has been depleted in, uh, in our system, uh, mainly by soil erosion and the use of uh, uh, substance and intensive farming system. As I said, uh, we have uh, less than 2% of uh, organic carbon in our uh, agriculture. So the question um, that we try to answer, uh, does conservation agriculture as um, 
um, can I say, uh, more sustainable technology enhance the soil or car, car, uh, organic carbon quantity and quality to shift uh, the negative effects of soil degradation and also climate change. Um, for that, we, uh, between INRA and ICARDA, we have one long experimental site in, in, the, in the one site in the central Morocco. Uh, we start this study since 2004. Uh, it's a comparative analysis where we have one hectare um, that we dedicated for CA, uh, for mainly no-till system. Another one with conventional at, at farmer are doing. Um, so um, we did the, the same that uh, farmer uh, doing the conventional system, but in the other one, uh, we try to at least keep 30% of residue. Uh, unfortunately, our farmers don't accept to keep residue on the land. Um, this is another uh, discussion that we can maybe uh, have. Um, and we use a weight food ligand rotation in the CA system, uh, which is not unfortunately the, um, the way of the wind in the conventional. Uh, for your information, more than 80% of our cereal based system are monocropping. So uh, this is another uh, issue. Um, um, the area where we have this study, as I said, is in central Morocco. In, uh, in, uh, Serial uh, plane, and we have uh, a vertic, uh, vertic soil uh, as uh, as, a, as a soil type, and the climate is um, can I say Mediterranean climate uh, around 40 uh, 100 millimeters, um, and uh, also a climate temperature uh, uh, Mediterranean temperature uh, around 25 uh, degrees. Um, so to, uh, we study many properties, but for this uh, presentation, I focus mainly on soil organic carbon. We use Valkyrie and Blake. We use also bulk density and uh, to, uh, to, to measure the carbon stock after uh, this uh, 60, year, 60 years of uh, study. We focus on humic uh, acid and also soil enzymatic properties. And we use a um, uh, method developed uh, for this issue um, um, in the dif different uh, uh, reference for this enzymatic activities. So the main result that we find that uh, after uh, 11 years of adopting CA, we uh, uh, shift from this degradation process that we have find in intensive system that we use in conventional system. And in this one, we at least start to increase the carbon on the soil. As you said in this result, uh, more than three uh, uh, in, uh, mega, um, ton by hectare increased after 11 years. For humic substance, also we have this result showing that uh, using this technology, we can um, enhance um, uh, the uh, humic and humine, uh, uh, humic acid and humine which is uh, very important uh, it's, uh, as an as indicator of the quality of the soil. And we have uh, other parallel studies showing that we have uh, increased aggregate stability of the soil. And also uh, we have more um, uh, positive effect to reduce soil erosion. 50% of soil erosion was reduced in, in this uh, site uh, due to this humic uh, and humic system. Concerning the um, uh, biological indicators, example here we uh, in, showed find uh, that uh, we increase uh, by three uh, times uh, the, the DNA, which is uh, an indicator showing the um, yeah, you know the the, the biota and the, the importance of the biota is is more higher under this system uh, than than in the conventional. We also uh, measured the alkaline phosphatase, which is uh, uh, also higher under uh, no-till compared to conventional, which means that we have more uh, phosphatase enzyme that can help um, in the cycle of, of phosphorus in the soil. Uh, this is very important uh, um, uh, for uh, Aralis sulfatase, it's important also in the, uh, for uh, sulfate a sulfur cycle in the soil, and we find that it higher and uh, uh, under this uh, and this uh, the soil uh, where we adopt this notch system um, compared to conventional system. 
Um, last one is the leucine aminopeptidase is important uh, parameters for uh, nitrogen and the cycle of uh, nitrogen uh, is is um, also concerned. But but we didn't find uh, some difference uh, in this uh, in this issue of this uh, um, enzyme. Um, mainly, um, we we still have to understand why. But uh, this is the another another situation where we have some uh, similarity between the both system. You have one minute, okay. Okay, I conclude uh, quickly that uh, this study attests that we need uh, the effectiveness of this uh, conservation agriculture as sustainable soil management in arid and semi-arid region. It's not only for a uh, temporal system, but also in arid and semi-arid. Um, the study showed the positive effect on, uh, on the, if we adopt the NT to increase the soil biological uh, activities um, uh, and uh, more research, I think, is needed to monitor the effect uh, of crop management and also on soil biological uh, enzyme activity in this semi-arid zone, as we didn't find many uh, study in our, uh, you know, uh, region. Um, to compare and to conclude, but this is a starting point and maybe um, we need to go further on this issue. Uh, by the end, I uh, need some acknowledgement uh, for support for having from ICADA and INRA for having this uh, result. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rashid. Um, thank you for an interesting presentation highlighting the impact of, of uh, Tillage management on soil carbon stocks and, and soil enzymatic activity uh, in, in your context in, in, in Morocco, the island coast context. Well, now uh, I'll, uh, I'll read out. Now we'll move to the Q&A session. I invite you to the Q&A session. And I'll read out a few questions selected from the chat so that you can respond to them live. So uh, here, um, First question to Mr. Muzinguzi. Um, what is the alternative uh, to glyphosate in, 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 your, in the study area? Is it manual, manual weeding? Is it another type of herbicide? Or, and, and how to convince the farmers? This is a, a question from Rosa Poch. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, well, in, 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 a, in a typical African agricultural system, uh, we've been using the handy weeding. Um, even when you're opening the land, we've been actually using the hoe. Uh, in majority of our farmers here, they use the hoe to open up land. Uh, so it is a traditional way of opening up the land with the hoe. But of course, with advancement in uh, uh, tractors and mechanization, uh, majority have been adopting the use of tractors, but still very few, very few. So uh, the farmers have been challenged on how they can actually do farming in the cheapest way. So the, the, the introduction of the herbicide as a conservation tillage approach has been quickly adopted by many, many farmers because you can apply this herbicide on a bigger junk of land and probably then open up the land with a minimum weed disturbance. Uh, so majority of the farmers have adopted it. And actually, we have quite a number of chemicals that have been introduced from all over the world to Uganda and this region. And we don't know their impact on soil biodiversity. So this glyphosate, of course, has been around globally. It's a global chemical, which is well known. But we still farmers, as they use it, they don't know its implication on uh, what could be happening in the soils. And uh, that's why we did a quick study to assess how these herbicides could be affecting the, the soil microfauna in the short term. Of course, we need to understand this further by looking at uh, long-term uh, experiments, but also looking at um, uh, studies where this herbicide has been used for long in our systems here particularly. So we don't have alternatives which are very easy to adopt because they are demanding financially. Uh, so this herbicide approach looks to be one of the quicker alternatives. And um, so we need to really develop a mechanism to, to help our farmers here. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Patrick. Um, uh, they have another question um, to Mr. Rashid. Uh, did you notice any increase in productivity of the uh, no-tillage soils? How do farmers respond to performance to the performance of conservation practices? Oh, okay, my, my um, interesting question. Um, yes, we noticed uh, um, the increase of uh, yield under the uh, no-till system, mainly in dry year. Uh, we, we have more uh, average about 10 ton uh, by, by, by hectare. Um, uh, I said uh, 10 cantal, one to two, uh, it depends of, of, uh, of, the, of the year, but mainly it's about 10 ton if the average uh, in a normal year. Um, and farmers uh, um, who are uh, working with us uh, in some project, uh, they start adopting the technology. Um, and uh, actually in Morocco, uh, we are working uh, to prepare like a roadmap to promote this technology for more than 1.5 million hectares for next 10 years, which means that not only farmers uh, understood the importance of this technology, but also our decision makers, the Ministry of Agriculture um, in, in, the, in the case of Morocco. And I, I think it's the same for uh, the North Africa because um, of the mainly uh, water limitation, but also the degradation of soil. And uh, when we adopt this technology, but for um, not only a few years, we have to keep it at least for a decade, uh, we can uh, really uh, increase the productivity and also uh, to shift from this uh, climate change and land degradation difficulties that we have in the, our region. Thank you very much. And there is a, also a, a, a question for Ms. Uh, Mary Bartz, uh, and it's related to the importance of, um, of the context to explain some of the responses you got, even as these responses may have also been influenced by time, because you did this study in, in with a 10 year span difference and there is changes, political changes, changes that happen uh, that might influence the overall uh, 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 context. So maybe you can also explain a bit because uh, as I, I noted earlier, knowing Brazil well, uh, the context of the Southern Brazil and, the, and, and, and where the first, uh, uh, study was carried out and the second in Mato Grosso, they are significantly different. So is, do you think this had a, a effect on, on the responses you got? Thank you, Mr. Edmundo, for the question. Yes, that, that is one point that we discuss among the, the, the researchers that the regions, they really are quite different. But on the other hand, uh, usually when we, we as part from, from this uh, no, uh, Brazilian no tillage Federation, uh, the public is mainly almost the, the same that are participating. So the, the view usually is the same. Uh, in fact, uh, of course, it's quite, it's, it's different. Paraná from, from the, the south, from, from, from the east, but in one hand, uh, we had a, 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 a period in Brazil that really the farmers, they forgot to do the good practices. And I think now they are seeing what is uh, the, the result of not doing uh, good practices to enhance the environment. So even as we, we are a reference for a uh, no-tillage system, a, con a conservation method, there was a period that uh, farmers really are they don't are doing the, the job great. So, and then I think it, that that is some question that can can relate uh, to the response. And even 2018 is four years ago, five years ago. In this time, also we have seen in all the regions a different view for the soil biodiversity in Brazil. So the the view is changing among the very uh, the, the the different regions from Brazil. In, in south, in, 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 in the Cerrado region, the, the, the views are different now. 
But for the response, uh, I think maybe can be some related with the particularity for the region, but uh, um, I, 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 how can I explain? I, I was hoping that in South Brazil, we, can, we, we would have a better response, even 15 years ago. So and I, I thought it was, was quite good for that time, and it uh, uh, was a little bit better 10 years later in some aspects, but in other aspects, we see this kind of confusion among the, the interviews. So it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy to explain, Mr. Edmundo. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you very much anyway, uh, Marie. And this brings us to the closing of this session and starting of the next uh, part of the session. Uh, so with these dear participants, let's start with part two of parallel session number five of, of the 2021 Global Symposium on Soil Biodiversity. Thanks to some of you who have joined since the first hour. And again, it is a great honor to be here with all of you today. My name is Edmundo Barrios, and I, I will be moderating this session. During this second hour of parallel session number five, we will be listening to four additional presentations of 10 minutes each. I will kindly remind the, the presenters to keep your presentations to 10 minutes so that we can have time for Q&A at the end. And at minute nine of your intervention, I, I will be letting you know that there is one minute left. And it is really important that we can leave a bit more time for questions and answers at the end. Before starting, I'll kindly ask you to check the Zoom chat as some rules of information are found there. Uh, please use the chat. Please use the chat box uh, to post your questions and include them uh, at the beginning of your question. Include the name to whom you are directing the the, the question. Uh, we will choose a few questions to be answered live uh, uh, later, uh, and, and the rest will be answered via chat. Uh, the host uh, continues to be Julie Ite, and she is here to help in case you have any, any issues, and you can contact her via the private message option of the chat box. With, without further delay, I would like now to give the floor to Mohamed Itbela from Federico Segundo University, Federico Second University of Naples in Italy, who will give his presentation entitled Repeated Applications of Organic Amendments Promote Beneficial Microbiota and Improve Soil Fertility. The floor is yours, uh, Mr. Thank Mohamed. You. Thank you, dear moderator. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, perfect. Share my screen. Okay, I hope uh, you are able to see the screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Mohamed Beta. I'm, uh, I'm a PhD student at the Federico Second University of Naples in Italy. And I will be presenting my, one, one of my PhD axes entitled Repeated Applications of Organic Amendments Promote Nutrition Microbiota Improve Soil Fertility and Improve could you hold your 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 microphone close to your? Ah, okay. Your, yes. Oh, it, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm yes, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. My presentation is entitled "Repeated uh, Applications of Organic Amendment Promote Beneficial Microbiota, Improve Soil Fertility, and Increase Crop Yield." Uh, intensive agriculture is characterized by high levels of input and output per unit of agricultural. Uh, land area, such as the overall practices like the use of uh, high yielding varieties, application of chemical fertilizers and agrochemicals, which in fact helps increase the crop yield and consequently result in economic benefits for the farmer. However, uh, the adoption of intensive agriculture systems for a long period might lead to a deterioration of physical, chemical, and biological quality of the soil, which in fact creates what we call in the agricultural field the soil sickness that uh, in turn or consequently uh, 
uh, affects negatively the crop yield and uh, the quality. Uh, in fact, the adoption of monoculture coupled with intensive use of synthetic fertilizers induce soil sickness as a consequence of uh, many deterioration factors like the deterioration of chemical and the physical properties, the reduction of microbial biomass and activity, the loss of natural soil suppression and accumulation of allelopathic compounds also that are uh, the result of the decomposition of the leaves on the soil surface. Yet, a possible solution for these problems is the application of organic amendments such as the compost, the animal and green manure, the olive waste, on the soil properties, including the improvement of soil aggregation and available water holding capacity, the increase of organic uh, matter in the soil and the microbial activity and biomass, the protection against soil-borne pathogens such as fungi and viruses, and in general, the support of plant growth. However, the, these beneficial effects of organic amendments, they largely depend on the quantity and the quality of the organic materials, but also on the application frequency, because many studies have focused only on the impact of single annual application of organic amendments, uh, but few available studies have considered, in fact, the effect of frequent applications. In this context, a two-year mesocosm experiment was performed by conditioning the soil with 11 treatments that compare the effects of conventional practices like the use of synthetic fertilizers or formulation against the organic management, like the use of different organic amendment types and different application frequencies. In our case, uh, we used on the, on the rocket Eroca sativa, uh, so we have evaluated the differences on the crop yield, the soil fertility, the soil microbiota, and also uh, independently with an experiment of these 11 treatments on the soil suppressiveness against uh, some soil uh, phytopathogenic uh, viruses. Uh, during this experiment, uh, three types of organic amendments were used. We have the alpha-alpha straw, the compost made from buffalo manure, and the biochar of beech wood, with also their combination based on the complementary uh, properties. For example, we have the alpha-alpha with compost. They are rich in uh, nitrogen. They are very important sources as nitrogen. And wood biochar, that is the main support of microbial uh, development. So we have mixed them uh, in order to obtain high crop yield, effective maintenance of soil fertility, and also to avoid the excessive in mineralization. And as you can see here, uh, there are the 11 treatments. The first one is the untreated soil as the control or soil treated with mineral fertilization uh, with frequent frequent treatments or mineral fertilization but previous with the fumigation and the fumigate that we use is metam sodium or the application of organic amendments as single application or frequent application. The single application was done by incorporating each year powdered organic material into the soil whereas the frequent application by spreading organic liquid extract on the soil surface uh, every week, uh, in fact. Uh, we have made 10 cycles of this rocket cultivation during two years. And later on, we have uh, measured uh, the following uh, parameters, like the soil chemical properties, microbiological properties, soil microbiota. And independently, we use the same treatments on, uh, in, in order to evaluate the suppressedness uh, against the tomato spotted, uh, it's, TSWV, tomato spotted wilt virus. Uh, okay, as you can see in the results, results they have demonstrated in the panel A that the cumulated crop biomass, it was significantly higher in mesocosm amended with single application of alpha-alpha with and without biochar, followed by treatments with single application of manure, then frequent applications of organic material and the lowest yield was observed in mesocosm subjected to soil fumigation and application of synthetic fertilizers. 
as also in the panel B that you can see, which is the difference between the second and the first year the, the, of crop biomass, we can see a, a variable response uh, when uh, applying organic amendments ranging from minus 30% uh, for the frequent application of manure to plus 31% for the frequent application of alpha-alpha with char. And uh, it's noteworthy that mesocosm treated with conventional management showed a remarkable negative uh, difference in crop biomass between the two uh, experimental years. Uh, regarding the, the, the nitrate uh, content in the leaves, which uh, gives an idea about the qualities, because this rocket uh, is, a, is a leafy vegetable. So we see that the use of synthetic fertilizers, as well as the addition of alpha-alpha with and without biochar as single applications, are the ones that recorded higher concentrations of nitrate in the leaves compared to the other treatments. Uh, and uh, when we move to the to the percentage of our life plants, seven days after sowing the seeds, we see that both untreated and soil treated with organic amendments had higher seedling establishment rates, more than 75%, uh, except for the frequent application of manure, which had a lower value of our life seedlings and very low for mineral and fumigation plus mineral treatments. Uh, and uh, moving now to the to the microbiota, especially the bacterial abundance at first. At the phylum level, we see that the hierarchical clustering has separated the treatments into three main groups. The first group included the at the left, included the untreated soil and treatments with frequent applications of manure, where the relative abundance here of cyanobacteria was higher than the other treatments. On the contrary, we had lower uh, relative abundance of uh, bacteria with it and proteobacteria. Then we have a second group in the middle composed of the other treatments with organic amendments where the chloroflexi and veromicrobia uh, phyla that were generally higher than in other treatments. Then we Sorry, have- You have one minute left. Sorry. Okay, then we have the third group. Uh, so, since we have uh, only one minute, uh, we move to the soil fungi. We see also our, uh, our variability among uh, the treatments. Then to the, to also to the correlation between treatments and uh, between the soil properties, the microbium, and we see uh, really we see a very a big uh, variability of the of these treatments or, or of the soil properties that are affecting or positively or negatively the crop yield, the percentage of alive plants, and also the nitrate in the leaves. And uh, to move to, to this, we see that when, when, when we applied the mineral uh, treatments with the fumigation, we see that we have the, the highest percentage of infected dead plants. Uh, whereas we, uh, the other organic amendments are as single or as frequent application that we had uh, a very minor, minor uh, dead infection, deadly infection. Uh, as, as, uh, as a general conclusion or as, a, as logical conclusion, the application of uh, organic materials compared with the use of synthetic fertilizers have an immediate positive effect both on soil fertility and soil microbiota which increases the crop uh, productivity as a long term. And uh, for the first time, we found that the use of organic amendments, they reduce the incidence of this virus infection, as well as the mortality of the infected plants. And future studies are needed to study more combinations of organic amendments and more application frequencies. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, uh... Mr. Um, Rashid, um, now uh, I'd like to um, to to give the floor to no no thank you for an interesting presentation sorry highlighting the impact of repeated application of organic materials and how they can reduce negative effects of fertilizers and soil fumigants in intensive agri uh, vegetable production I think this was an, an interesting highlight there now I, I would like now to give the the floor to Mr. Peter Kustachter, Kustachter from the Institute of Environmental Biotechnology in Austria, 
who will give his presentation entitled Microbial Biodiversity in the Field is Related to Fruit and Vegetable Health and Linked to Post-Harvest Quality. The floor is yours, Mr. Peter. Thank, Thank you. you very much um, for the organizers to give me the opportunity to present here. I want to speak about how microbial um, biodiversity on the field is connected to health of vegetables and fruits and is also linked to post-harvest quality. So plant is usually now recognized as a holobiont, which means it makes a unit with its microbiome. And the microbiome is uh, the microbiota and also the theater of activity of those microbiota, which is, was recently defined by the microbiome support project. But it's actually quite nice to visualize this using microscopy, as you can see here, uh, plant roots colonized by a thick layer of, of bacteria. So the plant microbiome is, is nowadays also uh, known to be involved in the germination, in plant growth, in plant metabolism, and it's also key to plant health. And this bios is usually connected to disease. And we also know that the plant microbiome is transferred from the seed to the plant habitats like roots or phylosphere. And it's also transmitted from seed to the next generation. Also taking up some, some stuff from the soil. So I want to give you a short overview about a, few, a collection of different studies that uh, talk about different things, like how does feed management affect fruits and vegetable microbiome? How does the microbiome quality, uh, the post harvest quality loss changes the microbiome? And what proportion of the microbiome is transferred from the feed to the post harvest storage? Uh, for this, we did a couple of high throughput sequencing studies uh, amplifying specific genes like the 16S gene or the ITS gene for bacteria or fungi and uh, analyzing the data using some bioinformatic tools like time 2 So let's start in the, in the field and let's look how management practice uh, comparing organic and conventional management practice induces shifts in the fruit of uh, apples. And uh, further, we looked also how are the differences in the different tissues. And later, we will look shortly about uh, the post harvest treatment. So, conventional um, management practice usually was connected to a, a lower diversity in comparison to organic uh, field management practice. And we also have a significant shift in the microbial diversity here. And interestingly, if you look at the different microhabitats in the fruit, so if you look at the peel or the fruit pulp or the seeds, we can also find distinct differences between those microhabitats. And again, comparing organic and conventional management practice, we find differences between the microhabitats depending on the management practice. And this was shown for bacteria and also a couple of years before by a colleague uh, in, on fungi. And now let's uh, start with the post-harvest treatment. So after the harvest, we try to, to treat our fruits to increase the storability. And one very simple but very effective method for apple is, is hot water dipping. And we try to ask, um, is this also connected with uh, microbial shifts of the fruit? And interestingly, uh, we did not find any, uh, any major shifts in the microbial diversity between treated and untreated fruits. However, when we looked at deceased fruits after the storage, we, we noticed a, a severe shift, a sh severe sh drop in, in diversity and a severe shift in the microbial composition of those diseased uh, apples. So post-harvest disease is co connected to a, a huge shift in the microbial diversity. 
So now I will move to, to talk more about uh, how the field is connected to the post-harvest storage. And for this, we did uh, a couple of studies on sugar beets in recent years, uh, studying the, the microbiome on the field and also in the storage piles, which are called beet clamps. So they are stored on, on the field sites in big highs before they go into the sugar factory. And uh, I will present uh, uh, the, the sum up of all these studies that we did here. So usually what we found is that deceased fruits in the field and also in the beet, in the beet clamps they usually had a lower diversity, and this was true for bacteria and also for fungi. We, we found that uh, we have a significant shift of the microbiome depending on the health status of those fruits, uh, and not so much depending on the origin of those samples. And this is what you also can see in the composition of, of the microbiome of those samples. We, we see a significant shift depending on disease. And interestingly, we really we find a, a very similar composition of the microbiome in, in healthy foods in the beet clams and also in the, in the field, and also a similar shift of the microbiome depending on the disease. So given this, this very similar taxonomic shifts, we try to, to track the the field microbiome onto the post-harvest storage and using some bioinformatic prediction tools, we saw that there was a huge connection between the fields and the post-harvest storage. So about uh, 60 to 90% of the microbiome was transferred. And interestingly, the decaying clams carried the microbiome of uh, deceased fields, while healthy clams carry a major fraction of the microbiome of healthy fields. And moreover, we, with these taxonomic shifts, we also try to develop some disease indicator taxa, tracking the disease development over time. And in sugar beets, this is uh, sugar loss. And uh, interestingly, we, we also were able to use this taxa to predict the uh, disease even before it happened. So to sum up all these uh, things that I tried to show you here with this collection of studies, um, we saw that field management practice affects the fruit and vegetable microbiome significantly, comparing organic and con conventional management practice. We saw that plant colonizing bacteria and fungi are crucial for fruit and vegetable quality. Uh, field microbiomes are transferred from the field to the post-harvest storage and microbial signatures are associated with post-harvest quality loss. So in the end, what we want to have is, is uh, we try to conserve the healthy microbiome on the fruits and the vegetables by influencing biotic and abiotic factors. And we should keep in mind that the the diversity that we found on the field is directly connected to the post-harvest uh, storage. And so if we have a, a healthy field and a healthy plant, we also have a healthy fruit and a healthy vegetable. Um, looking closer into the soil biodiversity, we also collaborate with a lot of different partners in Europe in the Horizon 2020 project Excalibur. Here we are trying to access the biodiversity of different agricultural soils in Europe, and we're trying to boost them using some uh, bioinocula. And please uh, follow up on this uh, using social media and our website. And with this, I'm already on the end of my talk. I want to thank all the collaborators in this uh, in this studies, the funding agencies, and of course, everybody that listened. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. And um, thanks for this interesting presentation highlighting uh, the, the important link between field microbial diversity and post-harvest post fruit and vegetable quality and health. I think this is quite a, a novel approach that reaches into food systems like few studies have done. 
thank you. So now uh, with this, I'd like uh, to give the floor to Mr. Eric Palevsky from Ramat Yishei Agricultural Research Organization in Israel, who will give his presentation entitled Effect of Free Living Nematodes and Their Associated Microbial Community on Conservation Biological Control and, and, and the Utilization of Soil Predatory Mites. The floor is yours. Thanks so much. I'm really honored uh, to be here today. Um, so I'd like to begin my talk. Uh, I'll just hold on a second. So yes, um, the title of my talk is Effect of Free Living Nematodes and its Associated Microbial Community on Conservation Biological Control. I have an international team from USDA, from Colombia, Canada, Brazil, and, I, and I'm from Israel, from the Agricultural Research Organization. Um, I'd like to begin just to show you, share with you the team from Beltsville, who was really responsible for some incredible images that I'm going to share with you. And I'd like to dedicate this talk to Gary Bouchon, uh, friendship and, and honor to him. He, he died just uh, recently from COVID, which is really quite sad. And this is the team here from from Beltsville. With that, I'd like to begin my talk. So my presentation objectives are to convince you with stunning images taken with a low temperature scanning electron microscope that soil predatory mites feed on both beneficial free living nematodes and plant parasitic root knot nematodes. And um, I'd like to uh, demonstrate how free living nematodes and their associated microbial community can enhance conservation biological control of insects and root knot nematodes. And I'll show this in two case studies that we performed. The first, the house on housefly control by Macrochellus and Bersoni, and the second on root knot nematode control uh, with a, the soil predatorymite Stratulodox schematus. So this is a, these are images of Stratulatus schematus, a predation on the free living nematode, Christianchus erivorus. And this is taken with a uh, low temperature scanning electron microscope, which allows us to freeze basically what we see and uh, present it as it was the, the second we saw it. So there's no loss, no loss of actually what happened. So here you see the, the mite, and this is, the mite identifies, the mite does not have eyes, it identifies nematode by scent, and, and first it first uh, does this by actually touching its prey, here the free living nematode, with its front leg, and then it uh, proceeds to touch it with its palps and actually bite into it. And so this is a slightly lar larger image, and here we focus on the gnathosoma, the mouth parts of the mite, and the green is the, are the palps, the orange are the chelicera, and it's biting into the nematode. And what we see, uh, this yellowish brown, is the liquid oozing out of the nematode that is frozen at uh, minus 120 Celsius. And these images are of the uh, plant parasitic nematode. So the predator might feed on a plant parasitic nematode, a very important nematode, Melodogeny incognita. And we see it uh, a, at first the entire mite and then focusing on, on the uh, anterior part. You can see the nematode here between its palps. And here um, from the side, you can see the uh, enlarged, uh, enlarged uh, view of the gnathosoma, the front leg, the green palp, the palps colored in green, the trilicera colored in orange, and the, um, the the uh, plant parasitic nematode is being held between its palps. The yellow is the labrum, which is sort of like the tongue of the mite. And here in, in dark red, uh, you can see the corniculi. And at the tip of the corniculi, there is a pore here where the salivary stalet will secrete the saliva. And the, the prey of these, of these mites are uh, extra orally digested. So you can see here that it is just before the the corniculi are thrusted into the nematode and, and after that it will be paralyzed and digested. 
So this is really quite incredible image, the first ever done, and it was actually taken by, by Dr. Gary Bouchan. And, uh, and this, uh, in, in the last figure here, you see the, the nematode enlarged with its uh, stylet. Okay, so I'm going to share with you two case studies. The first is uh, the effect of provisioning the free living nematode, Rabditella axii, on biological control efficacy of the housefly by the predatory mite Macrochelis embersoni. And the idea was that we wanted to see whether the addition of this uh, free living nematode would enhance the efficacy of the, of the uh, control agent. So we either gave it only the pest, so housefly eggs, or housefly eggs and, and the free living nematode. And this is how the uh, nematodes were reared. They were um, on, they were basically on beam being decayed by bacteria. And these, uh, and these nematodes are bacteriovorous, so they feed on the bacteria in this bean soup. And uh, so here we see, uh, so the biological control attained is um, presented here based on fly emergence. So the lower the emergence, the better the control. And we're, we're showing here the difference between two treatments either without nematode, so only the pest, and the addition of the free living nematode, which is so it's just in blue. So we can see that in the first week after in into fly emergence, we're actually having fewer flies where we only gave the predatory mite the, uh, the pest to eat and more flies when we added the additional food. But uh, the week later, what happens is you see a dramatic uh, reduction in the number of flies emerging where we added the alternative food versus a continuing uh, increase of emergence where it was only uh, offered the pest. And here uh, to the right, uh, you see the number of predatory mites. So this went from six mites to over 400 when we only offered the pest, but three times the amount when you added the pest and, and the additional food, uh, the free living nematode. Now I'm going on to the second case study that we uh, uh, that I'm presenting here, and this is on a dwarf tomatoes, microtom tomatoes. And we looked at a three effects at two levels, um, with or without the free living nematode in its culture media, with or without the predator, and with or without the uh, root knot nematode. So we had eight treatments, and it was replicated 12 times, and we conducted two experiments. One for five weeks and one for 15 weeks, one until flowering and second until fruiting. You have and, one minute left. Okay, so basically what you can see here is that um, the, the damage was, uh, was the least when we had both predators and free living nematodes, the most when we had uh, neither, but in between when we had either no predators but with the free living nematodes or with predators without, we had the same level of damage. And here, uh, we also saw an effect on, a, on, full, on nitrogen uptake and, uh, and potassium uptake, where free living, free living nematodes, they augmented both. So I'm going to fit these on my take home messages and, um, and open questions. So diet diversity is essential for soil predatory mite sustainability and free living nematodes are key ingredients in their diet. Terrestrial mites and semi-aquatic free-living nematodes depend on a fine balance between soil, water content, and aeration. To this end, soil food web researchers must work together with soil scientists to create healthy agricultural soils. And the open question, and this is perhaps a continuation to the first talk that we had, in different cropping systems, what organic amendments are best suited to enhance the conservation of the soil food web from microbes through free-living nematodes and predatory mites? And, uh, and these, are, uh, these are two images that, uh, or image and video that won the first prize in the Mesofauna contest of this meeting. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank the, uh, the students that participated from Brazil in this research and my uh, funding agencies. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Eric, uh, for uh, Explained uh, display of, of of visual proof of of, of the impact of, of soil organisms on biological control. I mean, thank you for interesting presentation. 
highlighting the goal of identifying and optimizing soil management practices and amendments to enhance biological control services of soil pests by soil organisms. With this, I'd like to give the floor to our last but not least presenter, Ms. Iris Victorino from Edward Mondlane University in Mozambique, who will give her presentation entitled Microbial Resources for Mozambican Agriculture, Use of Arbuscular Mycorrhizal Fungi as a sustainable alternative to chemical input in cotton production. Ms. Iris, your, the floor is yours. Is Ms. Iris there? Ms. Iris? Do you have maybe your, you are on mute, do, do you, maybe you muted? He's writing in the chat, uh, maybe he's uh, muted. Yes, she's yeah. saying that she can unmute. Can she be unmuted from our side? Yes, she has co-host rights, so uh, she should be able to unmute herself. Can you try Ms. Iris? Can you Excellent. hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. okay, perfect now. Sorry for the delay. I'm here to present uh, this work, uh, especially on uh, cotton. So I'll, I'll start by saying that uh, this work was done in Mozambique, a southern country from the African continent. That is your, is your video essentially... on? Can you put your video on or, or, or you don't have video? I don't have video. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll try to. Okay. Video on. There you Can are. You okay. So Mozambique is a, a country from the southern Africa, East Africa, that lives essentially from agriculture. And most of it uh, done uh, by local farmers or local families. And um, cotton production is uh, one of the main uh, uh, import um, culture that exports more than 80 million per year dollars. So this culture was uh, severely attacked by uh, uh, attacked by the biotic uh, and abiotic factors. One of them was the civil war that long lasted in Mozambique, and also soil erosion. So the country took part on an initiative, international initiative, to uh, improve the cotton production uh, using uh, sustainable um, alternatives of production. As we, you already hear from the other presentations since yesterday, uh, there are uh, biofertilizers or microorganisms that live in the soil and can be used as biofertilizer. And one example of them are the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, uh, which lives in the soil and uh, gives to the plants many, many benefits as uh, increase in the water uptake and the promotion or boost of uh, boost in defense against uh, root pathogens, soil pathogens in general. So the main objective of this uh, presentation. Sorry, uh, Ms. Iris, one second. Yes. I think your, your slides are not moving. So uh, uh, yes, and still... if you could indicate when I should uh, change the slide. OK, you may change it now to slide five, please. To slide next, five, next. five. Next one. Yes, five main objectives of this presentation was to evaluate the growth uh, of uh, cotton using uh, different substrates, uh, sand and soil, common soil, using two common, the next one, please. Thank you. 
and then uh, using uh, two varieties of cotton and uh, see if uh, their ability to be micorized. Also to evaluate uh, the, the, the effect of uh, fungal, uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungal on the growth. Uh, and also identify the present arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi in the soil cultivated with cotton. So next slide, please. next slide, please. We used, as I told before, three sub three variables, uh, sub uh, two different substrates, substrates, two different uh, varieties, and three inocula. So next slide, please. We noticed that uh, we uh, we uh, that the cotton varieties, both of them, were able to be mycorrhized and well mycorrhized, which will be seen on the next slide with the levels of uh, infection. And we used the optic mic microscope to evaluate this, and also transmission electron microscope. Uh, as you may see on this graphic, uh, we have uh, high, high frequency of uh, mycorrhization especially for the inocula having two types of uh, two types of uh, mycorrhizal fungi which is mycoagro um, uh, commercial uh, commercial inocula this is in accordance with uh, many reference that uh, says that when you use an inocula with uh, multiple species of uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi you may have uh, higher frequencies of um, mycorrhization next slide please we also know that the uh, 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 high ramificated root system in the plants, higher uh, height and less diseases. This for both variety, which is not shown here. And uh, this led to one publication uh, in an international conference. And also we intend to do, we intend to study uh, in the soil, as I, saw, as I told before, in the Mozambican soil to see uh, which uh, local arbuscular mycorrhizal could be identified. Next slide, please. So we did uh, our sampling in the center province of uh, Mozambique, Nampula, which is the main province that cultivates cotton. And we were, we were able to use, to, use uh, to identify arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi using uh, PCR. And these data are still on analysis using Illumina MySec technology. Please, next slide. So to conclude, I will say that, uh, yes, indeed. Next slide, please. Commercial inocula are able to colonize uh, cotton and uh, especially the, the inocula with more than, uh, than uh, one species of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And as future steps, we intend to uh, in investigate which are the species uh, that are present in Mozambican soil that is cultivated with, uh, with uh, cotton. Next slide, please. I'm uh, speaking very fast. I'm sorry for everyone. So next slide. I would like to thank the team that uh, that worked with this in this uh, particular pro project. Next slide. The University of uh, Turin, especially the Institute for Protection and Sustainable uh, Protection of Plants. And uh, thanks to this uh, amazing uh, audience that uh, uh, stood with the, us until the end. I'm the last presenter, so thank you very much. That is all I had to present to you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Iris. And thank you for an interesting presentation highlighting advances in the process of isolating and characterizing locally adapted uh, arbuscular micro, uh, mycorrhizal fungi inocula that can be then tested as part of the tailoring of biofertilizers for cotton in Mozambique. Excellent, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank now uh, we'll, we'll move on to the Q&A and there you are, okay. Uh, and let's see that we have some questions. Um, some of them have been already answered. There is one which uh, is directed to all, which says, could Sineco culture be classified as an intensive use of soil? And this is directed to all. Anyone would like to answer that? So 
sorry, may you repeat the question, please? The question is, could Cineco culture be classified as an intensive use of soil? Uh, Cineco, Cineco culture. Uh, if I might answer this question. Yes. Uh, in my opinion, uh, I don't think that uh, Sinaco culture could be uh, considered as intensive agriculture because uh, a lot of studies have demonstrated that the, the, it's, because Sinaco culture is like a sort of, uh, of a crop rotation. Because a lot of studies have demonstrated that what, what really decreases the crop yield is the, the, the monoculture in general, the, the, the decomposition of species specific leaves in the, in, the, in the soil that creates this sort of negative feedback in the soil that decreases the crop yield with the, with the successive generations. So when you when you add uh, many other species at the same area, this this uh, this is like considered a sort of diversifying the the carbon source in the soil. So which which enhance the crop yield. In fact, this is what I have to say. Very good, thank you. Any other question? Let's see. If we don't have any questions, uh, I myself will then make a question to, to, um, to Peter, Peter Kustatker, Stachter. And, the question is, how um, how did the con how do you think the the context of application will influence that linkage between um, the microbiome in the field and the microbiome in the in the in the post storage. And I, I find really interesting this connection that, that you, you make because I mean, we are, there is a, a, an increase in demand towards diversified foods, food and diversified diets. And what is missing is often vegetables and fruits. So that connection that you're making is really interesting at the food system level. So, uh, I'm just trying to think if you see that there may be what what would be challenges to that connection. What in terms of, of, of the predictability of being able to predict uh, uh, how that will influence the health of plants or health of products at horse harvest, and then how that will influence then. Uh, healthy diets and health in healthy people, which is a connection that you make, but still maybe some steps in between. Thank you. Okay, I, I would try to have the rest that. Um, so what do, what we usually we think as, as when when we eat some fruits or vegetables, we we eat them as, as a nutritional value, but but we also have to think about that they are colonized by millions and and. Of, of microbes and these are also part of those fruits and vegetables. So what we actually uh, saw in, in one of these studies is that, that even uh, uh, apple contains more microbes in the inside in the fruit flesh compared to its outside. So it's even impossible to wash it off. So by having a healthy soil microbiome and transmitting that to, to the fruit, uh, we also influence the, the kind of microbes that we also consume. And, and uh, now we also are in our Horizon 2020 project called HEDIMAT, 
which uh, is dealing with the exposome of human and and there we also study um what uh, the microbes that we consume have what, what kind of influence they have on on our uh, gut microbiome and on, on our um, gut health so i think everything is is kind of connected from the field to human health in the end yeah of course there's a lot of missing steps uh, still missing and and uh, a lot of uh, um, studies to perform in the future to prove everything but i believe that it's very well connected everything okay thank you very much let's see um okay there is a a question here to again to to peter does the skin of apple filter some of the microbiome or does it leaks every microorganism indiscriminately I, I believe um, we have to think about this differently because the microbes come into the fruit while the fruit develops. So already stuff that is on the on the flower will also be later on in inside of the fruit. So it's not coming fr from the outside and transfer transferred to the to the fruit flesh and to the seeds. So I think it's it's uh, we have to study it in the during the fruit development that's why also we see some differences in the different uh, um, tissues of the fruit okay thank you very much let's see uh, there i don't see any other question additional well i'll make one more question with uh, to dr um, eric paleski um, that was very interesting to see, and a bit appalling also to see that that these uh, um, biological control agents are eating both the good and, and the bad. Yeah. Now the the question you you raise the point of well, what sort of uh, organic or, or amendments can be used to to maybe manage that that relate that interaction? My question is. Is there feasibility that to make the the somehow make the 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 the, the negative um, the bad ones more tasty, so that they get preferential uh, preferentially eaten by the prey by the predator? So I, I, I don't think it's a matter of being preferential, but uh, free living, uh, what I was trying to say uh, and trying to encourage uh, the work with soil scientists, and especially focusing on what organic matter could be added to the soil to um, provide food for uh, bacteriovorous and fungivorous nematodes so that they'll be more abundant, but also that the soil structure uh, should be conserved and improved. Um, so if the, as, as we, I think as we improve soil structure and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and organic matter um, surrounding the roots, we will have larger populations of both bacteriovorous and fungivorous nematodes. And those will enhance, just like we showed in this simple lab study with the, with the house fly, those will enhance, enhance substantially the populations of predatory mites. And, um, and they will be more abundant and then uh, they will be uh, actually in place to protect the plant from these plant parasitic nematodes. So it's, I think it's a numbers game. And, um, and the, basically the better the structure, it, the, and the structure of the soil is also very important because these mites, they're obviously uh, substantially larger than nematodes and the structure is really a limiting factor for, the, for them to to um, be effective. So the better the soil structure is, the more organic matter there is available for these, for these um, free living beneficial nematodes, the more there will be. And, uh, and looking at this, just this one link in the chain, um, it will allow these predators to be more abundant and more available to protect the plant against these plant parasitic nematodes. They're really very, if you look at the percentage of nematodes in the soil, the plant parasitic nematodes are really um, 
uh, very small in, in healthy soils, they're really small proportion. And the real uh, abundance is in the healthier nematodes. Of course, they have many other functions, but yeah. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Well, um, okay, there is a, a question for Eric. How can small farmers reproduce the predatory, the predatory mites on farm? Thank you for this question. So I, I, I really think that we have to think, we have to work more towards conservation biological control and not augmentative biological control, especially for small farmers. I think augment, the only time I think it's, or the only place for actually adding biocontrol agents is in intensive agriculture, like in a greenhouse, where you can really manipulate your, your everything, your soil, your conditions, your, and it's also very intensive, so you're not applying it on large areas. But if the small farmer is working in an open field or in, or in orchards, then really he has to think about conservation agriculture. It means you have to, this is all about soil biodiversity and soil conservation, and we have to um, think about how we're going to make this soil a better place for the natural enemies to, to um, behave, to, to um, perform. And it's, I think it's all about protecting your soils, caring for your soils, reducing the use of herbicides, enhancing the amount of organic matter, improving the soil structure. Your predators are there. You don't have to put them there. The limiting factor really is the conditions that they're working at. That are work, they they need they need their conditions in order to perform. So I would not add predatory mites to the soil. I would I would um, work on enhancing organic matter, protecting the soil from compaction, doing everything to improve the structure and and the uh, and and the organic matter in the soil. Well, thank you very much. This was a really comprehensive uh, response, and. As I don't see any more questions, and we are about closing the the session, I'll like to maybe make some concluding remarks. And we have seen today uh, quite a diverse set of studies from different parts of the world, ranging from tiny microbes and land larger soil macrofauna in the context of agriculture and food systems to the exploration of people's perceptions on soil macrofauna importance. We note that there is a, a significant convergence that agricultural intensification represented by increased tillage, fertilization, and fumigation of soil shows negative impacts on the abundance, diversity, and activity of soil organisms responsible for soil-mediated ecosystem services such as soil carbon storage, nutrient cycling and availability, water availability and storage, and biological control of pests and diseases. However, there is an increasing alignment and uh, in, in interest in the alignment with ecological principles, uh, which has been highlighted. We, we, we just heard about you know, reduction in, 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 in disturbance, which often affects soil structure, uh, reduction in agrochemicals, increase in diversity of components in the system, but also in, 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 in niches, because what the, the even uh, notion of, of improved soil structure or, or is associated with all these different little uh, places with different conditions that create opportunities for different organisms to inhabit there. So diversity of niches supports diversity of species and hence it supports diversity of functions. So, and, and this all comes together with increasing amounts of organic of, of, of organic matter in the soil. And this comes together with increased recycling of, of organic materials and, and, and also the, the importance of system redesign that as a key notion of, 
of, of how to contribute to transitions towards sustainable food, uh, agriculture and food systems. I found particularly uh, uh, novel the study linking microbial diversity uh, uh, in the field with microbial diversity of fruit and vegetables uh, uh, and, and to post-harvest quality. Uh, because it makes this link that is often not, not uh, explored from the agricultural system to the, net, to the food system. So it's another scale, it's another connection, which I think was very useful to show the relevance of the information and the, and the evidence we are uh, uh, collecting here in, in, in soil biodiversity. So um, with this, uh, I think uh, I come to, to a close and we have one minute left. If there is anything else uh, anyone would like to say, Rosa, would you like to say something? Yeah, just uh, thank you uh, to all the participants and to this amazing session that has, uh, as Edmundo said, that has shown uh, many organisms and moreover, all the interactions between these organisms and, uh, and the environment, the social environment. And uh, well, I think that the main conclusion is that we know only a very small part of these interactions. And uh, so we need uh, still a lot of research looking for more, uh, more applications of these uh, relations between organisms and plants and how it affects to the food system as this is the, the theme, the name of the theme three uh, that we are having. So yeah, just uh, thank you also in Mundo for this, uh, sharing of these two hours, that it's not easy uh, through the screen, I know. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you to all. And we have come to the closing of a very exciting session with a lot of food for thought, a lot of new things that we probably hadn't heard before and, and images definitely that we had not seen before. So thank you again. So yeah, bye-bye. Thanks very much, bye-bye. Thank you.